I uh, have been going to the Navy Yard. My father was a uh, supply officer at the Navy Yard, and uh, I kind of grew up around naval bases. I was a Navy junior, as they called them. And uh, I frequently travel in New England, and it's almost like you can go to the most obscure place and someone has either worked at the Navy or had served on board a uh, submarine or has got a brother who worked there or there's some connection invariably and uh, it's always a surprise and a pleasure. Uh, thank you uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I thought I'd start off uh, to try to answer one question and uh, Everyone wants to know if the uh, Navy Yard is in Maine or New Hampshire. <laughs> this is from the uh, Portsmouth Chronicle, a newspaper published Monday, the 7th of November, 1859. And uh, it was an excerpt from the New York News. And it's just a short little piece. Many naval officers back then and still today, when they go to a foreign country, they generally tour Navy Yards and have acquaintances and see what the latest developments are, so on and so forth. Uh, quote, an English commander of the Royal Navy has recently had a singular adventure here. Having visited several Navy Yards, among others Portsmouth, New Hampshire, he returned to this city this is New York now, of course, where the article was written, but found the Navy Yard at Kittery, Maine, had escaped his notice. <laughs> <laughs> Accordingly, he retraced his steps to Portsmouth, which city he was surprised to find from the guidebook was quite near Kittery. Upon arriving at Portsmouth, he ordered a cab to drive him to Kittery and was still more astonished to be driven into the same Navy Yard which he had visited some weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> On investigating the matter, he found that Portsmouth, New Hampshire and Kittery, Maine were one and the same place and that his time and money were lost. You know? <laughs> so that's where the Navy Yard is. <laughs> kind of in limbo. It's actually a federal piece of property, so uh, whether the President, president of the federal government takes uh, the legal uh, aspect of it over the two states, I believe it does. Well, what does the Navy Yard mean to New Hampshire, to Vermont, to New England? I think a lot of people just look at it as a military place where they build submarines, repair submarines. Uh, they had a prison there at one time. Uh, actually, it's so interwoven, interwebbed with the whole community, whole state of New Hampshire, it, uh, to say the least, has a tremendous economic clout and impact. Certainly, billions upon billions of dollars have been invested into that uh, facility uh, 207 years now. That means jobs. Uh, uh, the political aspect of it is enormous. Each district, uh, the first district of New Hampshire is commonly known as the, the Navy Yard District. And likewise in Maine, that would be York County up through there, that's also known as the Navy Yard District. Every politician comes to the Navy Yard, shakes hands, it's just part and parcel of his uh, rounds. I would say the social aspect of it, uh, people are assigned there, a station there, they take out local girls, they marry, uh, uh, frequently their sons and daughters go to the University of New Hampshire, the University of Maine, then with their parents getting on in age, they send for them, and uh, they're in the community, and so it's just all... Uh, interwoven uh, with uh, the social fabric uh, of the community. And to say also the commercial aspect of it, now we have roughly 4,000 jobs at the Navy Yard. The restaurant industry, uh, tourism, uh, manufacturing, 
uh, supply houses. Uh, they're certainly totally dependent, uh, many of them on the Navy Yard. So it uh, has been a major force now for 207 years. I guess we're ready for the lights now to be turned off. And I guess I'll I always find up going through the song and dance trying to get the right combination of buttons. This is the logo of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. It was the Portsmouth Navy Yard until just after World War II, they changed the title of it. And their motto is Sales to Adams. I think the yard is an excellent record of adjusting technologically to the times, uh, the latest inventions, the latest techniques. And once the age of sail was over, they got into steam and from there into surface ships, finally into submarines. And it used to be diesel power for. Uh, Submarines, now it's Adams. 297 acres of land, and we'll get a subsequent slide. This is actually four islands which were ultimately joined by landfill. Uh, there's two uh, gates that uh, connect onto the land there. The castle or the prison is, this would be up in the upper right very distinguished landmark and uh, that is one of the reasons the Navy chose it. Uh, being an island it's defended easier. The access to the general public is controlled. Uh, and this is how it looked uh, before the, just as the Navy Yard was starting. Uh, the year 1800, uh, during the quasi-war with France, that's when, when Napoleon was uh, emperor, or he did become emperor a couple of years later, or two, four years later. Many privateers on the open seas were taking uh, prizes of American ships, so we decided to have a navy yard here. They sent survey teams and officials around for the best sites. They chose Portsmouth, number one, that's got a ice-free uh, river and harbor. And as you can see, uh, there's many uh, points of land uh, before you actually get to what became the Navy Yard. They're defended by forts, uh, Fort Constitution, Fort McClary, and others. Uh, we had an excellent workforce here, uh, shipwrights, uh, uh, carpenters, uh, rope people, uh, uh, what have you. Uh, we also needed a navy yard uh, in uh, the northern part of what was then the United States. Uh, so this, uh, this was decided upon. Real estate then was a little cheap. That first island, it's called Lay Claim Fernal or Dennett's Island, $5,500. And uh, the other islands were added in due time. This is Commodore Isaac Hull, one of the great heroes of the War of 1812. He was the uh, commandant of the yard. Uh, this is a fairly well-known painting in uh, U.S. naval circles, the launch of the USS Washington. 1814, the only problem was uh, uh, the British had blockaded uh, Portsmouth Harbor, never got out to sea, uh, never fought a battle uh, during the War of 1812. And there's a Portsmouth artist, uh, John Samuel Blunt, and just recently a uh, lady by the name of Deborah Childs uh, wrote a whole book on Blunt, and this is one of his most famous paintings. And uh, that is a, the ship house that it came out of. Uh, we've got other ship houses I'll show you. 
you have a Navy Yard, you need to defend it. And this is the Marine Barracks. Uh, they defended the yard uh, until the 1970s. And I might mention that the Navy Yard then and now just doesn't live in isolation. Uh, the Marines, if there was any problems, or the Navy Yard itself, uh, fire trucks, uh, fires in Portsmouth, they would go and help out the civilian population and uh, render every assistance. Uh, the earthquake and fire in San Francisco in 1906, the same thing happened there. The uh, army base there, uh, all the able-bodied uh, people they had on the base just went and fought the uh, flames and the uh, aftermath of the earthquake. Uh, I can't resist telling a little story uh, this, the, one of the, then a lieutenant in the USS, uh, the Marines, uh, General Alexander Vandegrift of uh, World War II fame, uh, later the commandant of all the Marines, he was here as a kind of fledgling, uh, uh, wet under the collar uh, type of uh, individual uh, in 1910. And... Uh, all the Marines lived in this building, and the commandant of the Marines or the officers lived on either end of it. Anyway, uh, on a very cold, wintry night, the uh, captain of the Marines called uh, Lieutenant Vandegrift. He says, uh, I understand there's some disturbances in the town of Kittery. Discord and turmoil. You get your men, go there, find out what's going on. If there's any problems, uh, take care of it. Come back and report to me. This was basically in the middle of the night. Vandegrift followed orders. Kittery was uh, deader than the cemetery at Arlington, uh, Virginia. Nothing was going on. So he came back and he reported in. He said, uh, no problems. Uh, people are weathering the storm inside, uh, no difficulties, and that was that. And a couple of weeks later, there was kind of a party for all the officers, and uh, uh, the captain's wife came over to Vandegriff and said, you know, my husband only plays practical jokes on his uh, most intimate friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is quarters A, or where the... Uh, Shipyard uh, commandant or commander lives. It's not only his residence, but it's used uh, for social purposes. Guests, uh, any diplomats, any congressional people, even the President of the United States. Uh, uh, they have parties there, Christmas, uh, uh, for all the uh, officers and guests. And so it has many functions above and beyond where he lives and he can walk to work. I think that is important. The, if there's any emergency, he's right there. Uh, the story goes that Mrs. Isaac Hull was not very happy with Portsmouth for some reason, and this was built during uh, Isaac Hull's uh, uh, term or uh, uh, station duty there at Portsmouth, so uh, it's been there ever since. Uh, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is just like a community. Uh, uh, obviously the shops, the buildings, uh, they have quarters for people, uh, housing, uh, athletic facilities, baseball yard, chapel, bowling alley, craft shops, a hospital, picnic areas, and a cemetery. Uh, there was not only naval personnel buried there, but the uh, Empire Knight, which was a merchant marine ship, went down, and uh, uh, a civilian Canadian ship during 1944, they buried the deceased here, and they also had a uh, uh, Air Force uh, facility up near Brunswick, Maine. I don't know if it's one and the same uh, that the Navy has had, but uh, uh, there were some Royal Air Force pilots that were undertaking training and uh, 
some of them crashed, unfortunately, and uh, passed on. And 50 years later, I've actually had widows and relatives of these pilots wondering where the, their loved ones are buried, and they're buried here in this yard cemetery. They have offices row there, and that's the uh, right next to uh, quarters A. Uh, uh, they're still in use today. Built to last, uh, brick, uh, and a modern view of offices row. Franklin Ship uh, House, I believe the date that was built uh, was. Uh, uh, maybe in the uh, 1820s or 30s. And in its day, it was the largest ship house of its kind in the world. Obviously in New England, uh, during the winter time, uh, cold weather, snowstorms, ice, all the rest of it, you want to be inside. And this was a year-round facility. And uh, many of the famous ships built at the yard were built here at the Franklin Ship House. And unfortunately, 1936, there was a fire, and it, I guess, burned in uh, probably uh, an hour's time, just completely destroyed it. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't used at that particular point in time as a ship house, it was just a warehouse. I've heard all kinds of rumors some claim it was spontaneous combustion, others say oily rags. Uh, there were no fatalities or uh, in injuries, fortunately, in the blaze. Uh, that is the USS Constitution, which is now down in uh, Charleston Naval Navy Yard or Boston Navy Yard Harbor. Uh, and it's decked over, it was actually used as, as a training ship uh, during uh, the 1880s, 1890s, and uh, uh, it's the oldest uh, commissioned vessel afloat, 1797, and uh, uh, it was also used for many parties, ceremonial occasions, and the uh, new recruits uh, took their training aboard the, uh, the USS Constitution. And one of the sail loft uh, houses there, again, as I say, built to last in stone or in brick. Uh, this is Jenkins Gut, which is no longer there today. That is all filled in. And uh, the Navy, after the Civil War ended, uh, decided it needed more land to expand. And uh, in due time, they filled in to make it uh, continuous land, and part of the gut was actually a, uh, used for the, uh, uh, trying to think of the uh, dry dock for uh, the yard, uh, the second one they had. When a ship came in back in those days, and I guess even today, you don't leave powder, dynamite, uh, ammunition on board the ship with uh, carpenters and other people working around, the slightest spark might cause a accident, a, an explosion, a conflagration. So this was a uh, place where they stored the ammunition. Once the ship was ready to go back to sea, they would put all of that back on board. But this was planned so if it imploded, it would stay inside, the explosion would stay inside these very massive uh, stone uh, walls and the explosion would not actually go outside. And that is another one and that's the uh, museum there at the yard today. This is what was known as Shot Park. This was a dream and a uh, contribution of David Dixon Porter, a naval officer who was there at the uh, yard in the late 1850s. Uh, he was second to Farragut. Farragut is the leading Union uh, naval officer during the Civil War. And this is the 
believe the Constitution again being rehabbed. Uh, in the, you can see how huge these things are, even though it's still a wooden ship. Muscle power, the oxen, they were not in the Union. They uh, didn't strike for higher wages. And they uh, were used right until up until 1901. And now, of course, all the transportation is either truck or uh, there's a railroad uh, in the yard as well. Uh, the Civil War, that is another whole slideshow, a whole another book that I did. Uh, this is the launch, finally, of the Franklin in 1864. Every launch always brought out uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Uh, the Franklin was actually so old and had been uh, worked on and changed and all the rest of it. It was more or less a supply ship rather than a war vessel. And uh, supposedly, according to hearsay anyway, uh, Frank Jones, the famous brewer, congressman, owner of the Wentworth and Rockingham is the large man standing in the carriage there. During the Civil War, the Yard built 26 ships, among them the USS Kearsage. It's amazing how much work, uh, re research, books, and interest is in the Kearsage today. And it sank the Alabama in 1864. Uh, maybe it didn't end the Confederate threat at sea, but certainly a tremendous moral and victory, and it was certainly the Union High Command and uh, Salmon Chase was the director of the Secretary of the Treasury said uh, from now on the European nations uh, as far as uh, economic and financial and matters, uh, diplomatic matters, uh, they will cooperate uh, fully with the Union and the winning side. And here's a little poem to the Kearsage. And another view of the USS Constitution decked over. Of course, all this has been stripped away nowadays. Uh, the, I think it was in the 1890s, the ship went down to Boston. I think it was Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, who was John F. Kennedy's grandfather, wanted to come down. And uh, it was actually uh, built down there. Portsmouth never got it back. and uh, the age of wood and the ship houses and all that. Yep. Another view of the Constitution. Uh, if you've been reading the papers the last week, this is the fire department at the yard. Of course, this is an older photograph. Old building, and Senator Susan Collins of Maine uh, has put in the budget uh, money for a brand new fire department building and uh, presumably, hopefully, they'll get it in the old uh, building, as you can see, by 2007 standards is quite obsolete. Eighteen eighty-four, uh, there was a uh, rescue up in the Arctic and uh, Adolphus uh, Greeley, who's standing there, and his surviving uh, shipmates came back, were rescued, and that was uh, one of the big events of the yard. Uh, Greeley uh, later went on and became one of the founders of the Explorers Club, uh, which is now in New, New York City. Here's our man Farragut. Kind of an interesting story about him. He was the first admiral and no one knew exactly what his uh, dress and his uh, epaulets and uh, stripes should be, and he designed this himself. So he made sure he got plenty of stripes and <laughs> ribbons and uh, all the rest of it. Uh, this is, he was visiting a uh, uh, Shipyard commander at the yard, Pennock, I believe his name was, and died in Quarters A. And uh, 
this is right outside uh, Quarters A on a gate there or a fence. And uh, George Dewey, uh, later the Spanish-American uh, war hero, uh, wrote these words in uh, memory of Farragut. One little story about uh, Admiral Dewey that I include in my Civil War talk, kind of an interesting story. We had a very long uh, peninsula and kind of a promontory called Poland de Dam Point, also called Henderson Point. It just stuck out there through the years. There was all kinds of uh, accidents and vessels running in, into it, both civilian and naval. And anyway, in 1864, then Captain uh, George Dewey, who was one of many captains in the U.S. Navy before his fame later on, uh, he was in charge of getting the U USS Agawam ready for sea. And uh, it was going to be his ship, and he wanted everything let it perfect. Well, anyway, they got a little trial voyage underway, uh, shakedown cruise, and it went right into uh, Henderson's Point. So they had to bring it back for repairs. And uh, uh, Dewey was there every day, kind of supervising the men, making sure it was getting repaired adequately and quickly and efficiently. One guy wasn't working particularly hard, at least Dewey thought so, and uh, Dewey kept bellowing out these orders on kind of a uh, uh, bullhorn. And the guy, uh, uh, Garland was his name, uh, uh, just seemed to be a loafer, at least in uh, Dewey's eyes. So Dewey took the uh, uh, bullhorn and just uh, hit him right in the face with it. And uh, that went right to Washington. Gideon Wells said, I don't know what we should do. Either Court Marshal Dewey, get him out of the service, or two, if we can get around it, we need uh, officers, and it would be all for the best if this was treated as a civil case. And Dewey uh, went into uh, the uh, court in Kittery, Maine, and it was, uh, I guess, an assault and battery charge. Fined $10, got him off the hook. So this is the Navy's counterpart of uh, uh, General uh, George Patton, who uh, slugged a man in a hospital during World War II. A view from uh, Building 13, where the... Uh, Officer, uh, the administrative officers were for many years, and you're looking down and uh, looking right out to the sea. Another view. During the Civil uh, Spanish-American War, the Marines were involved uh, in a uh, battle down at Guantanamo Bay. This is on the a plaque there at the Marine Barracks. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Teddy Roosevelt didn't single-handedly uh, win the Spanish-American War <laughs> and charge up single-handedly uh, San Juan Hill with uh, his uh, Rough Riders. After the Spanish-American War ended, we had uh, some Spanish prisoners of war come up here uh, the reason being uh, Portsmouth, uh, a more temperate, uh, cooler climate to keep them down in Florida or actually in Cuba or Puerto Rico uh, with the dangers of yellow fever and other diseases. So they brought them up to Portsmouth. Here they are uh, doing their laundry at water's edge and this site where they had tents and uh, wooden uh, structures is now the site of where the present-day uh, prison is located. Well, this uh, proved to be at least part of the reason they uh, decided to erect a naval prison here. This is the first one part of it that went up, 1908. And that's what it looked like when it was finished. Uh, the most modern part of the building is would be on the left side of the screen, put up in 1943. Uh, in that 
World War II era, they had 4,000 prisoners in here, uh, Navy and uh, Marines. And here's some of the uh, security force at the yard. Some of the cell blocks there. Very uh, Spartan-like. Well, the man that was appointed to become the warden there at the uh, Navy Yard prison was this man, uh, very well known in penal circles, uh, uh, Thomas Mott Osborne. Uh, he had uh, extensive experience in civilian prison, Auburn and Sing Sing in New York State, and the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, during World War I, tapped him personally, said, we want you to come to Portsmouth and operate this prison. Uh, Osborne said, look, I'm a civilian. I need authority. I need status. Some naval officer is going to say, who are you to come here and tell us what to do? Daniel said, I'm going to make you a naval officer and you'll be in charge. So he is in uniform. He had a slogan, trust and be trusted. Osborne felt that too many able-bodied men might be in this prison for just minor infractions, AWOL for a few days, little barroom brawl. The point being, uh, fighting uh, World War I, they serve no purpose languishing in prison cells, but should be back on active duty and released. And uh, Osborne, as the term went back in those days, returned 200 prisoners back to active duty and he felt uh, schooling and education, athletics. Uh, he had actually come to the yard and donned the prison garb. He called himself Tom Brown and just uh, incognito wandered around, saw what the problems were, so he emphasized uh, with the uh, men there. And that's a uh, little cartoon about him. <laughs> he wrote extensively on uh, prison topics and oh yeah here's my favorite uh, question here if you know don't yell out who is this good looking sailor if you know don't speak up yeah. <laughs> this happens to be a young 18 year old sailor by the name of Humphrey Bogard oh. Humphrey Bogart, and this was taken before the incident, he was stationed at Brooklyn Naval Shipyard and assigned to escort one of the prisoners up to Portsmouth. And this was done all the time. It just wasn't something Bogart was, he was one of many who did this. So he, they, Bogart and the prisoner got on a train, went to the South Station, and... Uh, to get to the North Station back in those days. It was either a walk, a cab ride, or whatever. And uh, the prisoner, uh, during the walk, uh, said, Bogey, or whatever he called him, I need a smoke bad. He was manacled and everything. Bogard, being 18 years old, I guess kind of naive, kind of bent over uh, with uh, the uh, lit uh, match. And the fellow, uh, the prisoner, just... Uh, came up with a shackles and went right into uh, Bogey's face and head. And uh, actually the prisoner ran away and Bogey got him, brought him back. They sewed up Bogey as best they could up in uh, Portsmouth. He delivered the prisoner. And if you go to the Bogart m movies, you know he's got a very prominent scar on his uh, lip and he spoke with a lisp. So that's the... Navy Yard's contribution to American cinema. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, still inside the prison there. Uh, that is a uh, YMCA. They came there and, uh, as I say, opened up uh, social and uh, athletic and other good activities for the prisoners. 
This is a modern view of uh, Building 86, which is the present day administrative headquarters of the yard. It's historical importance. Back in 1905, the Russo-Japanese War had been raging. Uh, President Theodore Roosevelt wanted to uh, get the war ended. Uh, it was just creating uh, an imbalance of power in the Asia. And he invited the delegates to Portsmouth. And uh, the Russians were on uh, the far side. That would be the right side of the photograph. The Japanese on the left side. And they met right in the middle uh, for their negotiations. They went on for one month during 1905. And finally, the peace treaty was resolved and the war stopped. And here are the delegates there, Komura and uh, Count Viti. And uh, this is the plaque on Building 86 today. And uh, many Japanese visitors, uh, sometimes they can get in, sometimes they can't. Being foreigners, it takes a little diplomacy and special permission, but uh, uh, the war ended and uh, this plaque was put on the building. Nineteen oh five was kind of a busy year. Uh, Henderson's Point that I talked about before, all these ships uh, banging into it. It was a uh, navigational hazard. They decided to blow it up and get rid of it once and for all. I don't know that much about engineering, but plenty of coffer dams and digging and all the rest of it. And uh, that's uh, the protuberance you see there is Henderson's Point before they took it out. And still more work on it. Uh, the Navy prison is in back there. And finally the time came, they blew up Henderson's Point. This was the largest man-made explosion uh, up until that time in 1905. And I guess every tourist, every native uh, went there to see it. There wasn't any loss of life, no injuries, no nothing. Unfortunately, a trolley and a, I guess it was an automobile, uh, certainly they weren't uh, very well advanced. Uh, the only, there was a collision on the outskirts of town. That was the only problem that occurred. And uh, those are radio towers there. And uh, some of the group photographs. World War I, uh, of course it was a revolution in so many ways. The submarines have been being built there at uh, the government yard. The, our Navy yard built the first government uh, submarines. And women uh, were employed at the Navy yard in force for the first time operating uh, machinery. And uh, here are the World War I counterparts of Rosie the Riveter. They did an excellent job. Here's the uh, security force. Here's the uh, riveting uh, there. That is uh, the uh, second man from the right is uh, uh, Thomas Mott Osborne, the warden. And this is the launch of the L-8 in, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact date, 1917. And the Franklin ship house is still up there uh, uh, at that point. Well, I kind of uh, said something earlier in Ice Fee Port. There was one incident where the Piscataqua did freeze over, 1918, and this was the uh, Navy uh, uh, little boat that went back and forth with the workers, and it was frozen in ice, and so people had to walk to work on the ice. As I understand it, uh, this ice actually just came down the river from upstream and just simply collected there and just stayed, uh, I don't know how long, and uh, uh, so there are very rare instances 
of uh, the uh, port being uh, kind of frozen over, at least part of it. During the 20s, uh, kind of a uh, lean time for the yard, but we did build some boats. Uh, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, when he uh, did become president, he had been assistant secretary of the Navy. Uh, he promoted Navy and Navy interests and the art itself. And that's a cartoon. Uh, apparently private uh, shipyards wanted to take away the work of... Uh, uh, this is a cartoon. You can take it for what it's worth. But uh, Rose said, like, no, the yard, it's a government yard. We are going to keep this open give the work to uh, Navy people, Navy workers, and a lot of the Works Progress Administration people worked there. Many prisoners uh, worked on outside work gangs, and they kept going. And this is a, uh, I believe, a Coast Guard boat that was built. Another one, submarine. <coughs> This is the USS Falcon. Uh, again, this would be a, another complete lecture. The sinking of the Squalus, USS Squalus, 1939. Uh, Well-known story. Uh, the uh, ship went down, or the boat went down uh, off the Isles of Shoals, I believe the 23rd of April, 1939. And they had the uh, McCann rescue uh, chamber, which went down, and they could take three men up at a time. And uh, 24 uh, men in the stern or position uh, perished, and 33 in the aft or forward uh, part of the uh, boat. They were down uh, a day or so, a couple of days, and uh, they were saved. And this is a famous photograph, won the Pulitzer Prize for photography in 1939. Jimmy Jones of the Boston Post. Uh, these tugs and other boats in back were trying to raise the squalus. They got it up just for a split second, and then moments later the whole thing just went back down. Finally got it back into dry dock, repaired it, and it became the uh, sailfish and had a very distinguished World War II record. There were some uh, sailors that called it the squalefish. <laughs> and uh, the captain of the uh, sailfish said, if I hear that word aboard my boat anymore, you're getting a court martial and you're off my submarine and you can depart. So that stopped that. And uh, this is a permanent memorial to both uh, the Squalus uh, and Sailfish people. And uh, this is uh, Squalus Park at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, many ceremonies are held here. Change of command, uh, retirement, uh, promotion, picnics are held there. And Building 86 is in the background. And What's that? Isn't there a caboose there? Uh, Looks I, like a railway car. Uh, I don't think that's uh, the case, no. It's superstructure. <laughs> superstructure. Captain McDonough, who's still around, one of the most prominent advocates to keep the yard open through the years. He was the shipyard commander during the 1970s and... Uh, he decided uh, we ought to promote the yard. Everyone comes here, they see it from the uh, river and so on and so forth. They can actually look at it from the Newcastle side. And let's just put up a sign telling the world who we are and let's be proud of the yard. And as junior officer said, well, uh, uh, Captain McDonough, we can't do that. We don't have authorization from Washington. McDonough says, we'll do it anyway. So they put this up, and uh, once it became a fait accompli, an accomplished fact, 
uh, that sign has been there ever since. Um, and now we're getting into the, uh, you can see the heavy machinery that is involved there. This is the uh, uh, gate number two. The, they had 20,000 workers at the yard during World War II. They had to put in a second gate. Right now they're replacing it and uh, putting in a more modern, the security over there, of course, is enormous today all the uh, electronic gadgetry and all the rest of it. And here's Rosie the Riveter, uh, Portsmouth Navy Yard uh, in very famous event. Uh, three uh, uh, submarines uh, launched here, one from uh, one of the building ways, January of 1944, the Ronquil Escaba Scabafet, the Redfish, uh, and I guess one other. And here's a blow-up of the uh, Redfish uh, commissioning. And then after World War II, we got into the nuclear age. Uh, maybe this is well known. We captured uh, many of the latest German submarines that were being worked on in Germany or in Holland. We told the men working on them, just come over, finish the submarines in the United States, no questions, put in all the components and latest designs and equipment. And of course, the United States wanted the most advanced submarines they could get. The snorkels uh, replaced later on by the nuclear submarines. And there's one of them there. When did the yard become exclusively a submarine? Uh, they built the first one. Uh, they got the contract 1914 with the L-8. And the last submarine that was built, 1969. So that was 55 years of construction. This is the swordfish that went up to the North Pole. This Santa Claus broke through the ice. And uh, this uh, got a lot of publicity. And the whole point being that the Northwest padded Passage and going under the North Pole was, and at least in uh, the modern age, was from a mil military standpoint feasible. Uh, there's the chapel there at uh, the yard. And uh, when the thresher went down, they put this plaque there on the uh, uh, chapel. Another, uh, those are the uh, missiles going, those things. They're called, uh, the nickname is the silos. And uh, uh, this, of course, was active through the whole Cold War. Uh, that's the Nathaniel Green coming out. Another submarine, the Dolphin. And this is the last one that was launched, the Sand Lance, 1969. That is a, uh, I think I've got this right. Uh, the Navy realized that just like the uh, business world was changing, uh, this is a daycare center uh, for uh, shipyard workers there for young little children. They have a... Uh, started this actually during uh, uh, the Cold War, a program with UNH to get uh, college students over there. If they wanted to become engineers or welders, at least they uh, get on the job training. And the Navy has its own uh, uh, railroad engines. Well, during the 1990s, uh, the BRAC Commission, Base Realignment, uh, let's see, and uh, Closure Commission were closing naval bases across the country. And this is Jeremy Border who came up and uh, was up several times. 
his feeling was save the Portsmouth Navy Yard, Naval Shipyard as part of the Navy team. Uh, this is the, another one of the launches. And of course Portsmouth has to, in the age of economics, has to make sure it's doing its job economically, everything feasibly. Uh, these are standard stories in the press that we're spending too much money. So this is uh, some of the uh, Portsmouth was building, hopefully, their submarines under budget or close to under budget and uh, behind schedule. And another one of those uh, type of graphs. And here's Border who came back another time. Uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, main uh, delegation there. Uh, uh, then Representative Olympia Snow, now Senator, uh, Senator Cohen, and I forget the fellow uh, on the extreme left there. And unfortunately, uh, Border later committed suicide, uh, but his uh, work continues on. The Navy now is very conscious conscientious about uh, landfill, any radiation, any uh, nuclear waste, and here they are uh, kind of making sure that uh, uh, the waste is either carted away, disposed of, or otherwise eliminated somehow. Well, we had the centennial of the Navy Yard in the year 2000, and the Navy being very... Uh, conscientious, uh, they wanted to satisfy both states, whether the uh, Navy Yard was in Maine or New Hampshire. The main pine is on the uh, left and the old man of the mountain is representing New Hampshire is on the right. And they dedicated the Navy Yard Museum there. Uh, this is a fascinating story in itself, what might have been a very well-known developer by the name of Joseph Sautel wanted to take over uh, with the Navy's permission. The Navy wanted to do this. The Navy prison, get it rehabbed. Uh, what was left of that old prison was just rusted out. The uh, plumbing and electrical thing, they ripped all that out and Captain Tom Williams decided let's hopefully turn this into a civilian office park. And that was approved and what happened within a relatively short time, Mr. Sautel passed on, he was going to put in ten million dollars to make this into a office park and of course 9-11 uh, with security considerations. Uh, the prison was never converted into uh, uh, such a facility. Uh, it was going to be totally, what should I say, segregated from the military part of the yard and the people could come and go to work. There'd be no security lapses. Uh, there'd be parking in there, their own restaurants, their own medical, and uh, I think it would have worked, but uh, that uh, feeling, I guess, is gone. And again, this is what might have been. You can see uh, prime waterfront uh, property, either for uh, an office park, or even a hotel, a resort, you name it. And here's a, uh, just shows you the end of the shift and uh, coming out of gate one. And I think morale is still strong over there. The Brack Commission, uh, I think the exact date was the 25th of uh, August uh, 2005, decided by a seven to one vote the Navy Yard will stay open. As you know, the Brunswick Naval Air Station wasn't so lucky. Many other naval uh, yards have been closed. Uh, there's only four Navy Yards left. Portsmouth, Norfolk, that will be there forever. It's mid-coast. The Pearl Harbor Navy Yard, which is obviously needs something out in the Pacific. And the Puget Sound, uh, Washington 
State Navy Yard. We have about 4,000 workers there today at Portsmouth. Uh, they brought in the uh, part of the uh, grayling and have a park there. And uh, this lady in the center there decided let's have a workers park right across the street from the Squalus Park. And Captain Tom Williams, uh, who Alf, uh, decided this was a good idea, is standing extreme left. And that park with benches is there today. Many yard workers go there uh, for lunchtime. And they're just trying to humanize or civilianize, uh, if that's the right word, uh, uh, make the yard a pleasant place to work. And this is the official organization that the yard belonged to, the Navy Sea. Uh, whether the yard is going to remain open or not, I can't answer that. No senator or congressman can. I don't think the President of the United States can. And uh, uh, we're doing well, certainly in 2007, and uh, uh, certainly a component of this state that uh, its uh, value is certain for 207 years will continue to augur brightly, uh, certainly in the future. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.